Welcome everyone to the fourth installment of the Health Equity Book Series brought to you by the Division of Health Disparities Elimination, the Office of Primary Prevention, and the Health Equity Advisory Team at the Tennessee Department of Health. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Elizabeth Hart. I am the Director of the Office of Faith-Based and Community Engagement that sits within the Division of Health Disparities Elimination, along with the State Office of Rural Health and Rural Health Access, as well as our Office of Minority Health. We are really excited about today's conversation and we are as well. Just a couple of housekeeping notes and announcements. You know, we would love to have you join our Tennessee Health Disparities Task Force. It was formed in early 2020, not long after COVID were first identified in Tennessee. And we have grown to a large group of individuals representing many different industries, all with the same goal, to reduce health disparities. Our four priorities are chronic diseases, mental health, infectious diseases, and environmental health and justice. You can learn more about the Health Disparities Task Force at www.healthdisparitiestn.com. Simply click on the link for the Health Disparities Task Force and learn more information. Additionally, we have a wonderful tab on the homepage of that website with a link to stories of individuals from black and brown communities here in Tennessee telling their stories of how they navigated through COVID-19 and why they received the vaccination. We invite you to not only read those stories, but also submit your own. Again, that website is www.healthdisparitiestn.com. A couple of uh, housekeeping notes. If you have questions for our featured author today, Dr. Tatum, please feel free to put those in the chat feature, along with any comments, again, that you might have for her as we go through this conversation. We'll be sure to share those with her at the end of this program. And without any further ado, I want to now introduce our featured author. Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum is interim president for the 2022-2023 academic year of Mount Holyoke College, president emerita of Spelman College, and the author of the best-selling book, the one we're gonna be talking about today, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria and other conversations about race now in its 20th anniversary edition a thought leader in higher education she was the 2013 recipient of the carnegie academic leadership award and the 2014 recipient of the american psychological association award for outstanding lifetime contributions to psychology Dr. Tatum holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Wesleyan University, a master's and PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Michigan, as well as a master's in religious studies from Hartford Seminary. Welcome, 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 Dr. Tatum. So happy to have you here today. I'm so delighted to be with you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. We, we have some great questions that were submitted by our task force and, and other members of Tennessee Department of Health staff. So let's just jump right on into some of these questions. And again, if you have questions for Dr. Tatum, please feel free to drop those in the chat feature. First question, you know, your book was, was originally published just before the turn of the in 1997. As we are all aware, the climate figuratively and literally has changed in the last 20 plus years here in the United States. In your opinion, based on your decades of research and career work, has your perspective changed at all since initially writing your book? Well, I would say that um, the, the society that we're all living in has changed. So of course there have been some changes in how I think about these issues, but I think it might be helpful to just review maybe briefly what some of those changes have been. So I, I sometimes describe them as the four Ps, uh, the first P being population. You know, over the last 20 years, our population has shifted. Um, it is much more diverse. It, you know, I was born in the 1950s. I was born in 1954. In, the, in 1954, the U.S. population was 90% white, 10% everybody else, not 10% black, not 10%, 10% everybody else. So a vast majority, you know, no matter what community you grew up in, 
it was likely to have been a largely white community, at least some portion of it. But today, that population is increasingly diverse. So we know that if for children who are born today, they're being born into a US population that is approximately 50% white as opposed to 90%. The population of Latinx, um, Asian, Native people, as well as African Americans combined is adding up close to 50%. And so that shift in population has also generated a shift in our politics um, in terms of how um, public officials talk about the diversity of our population, whether they talk about that as a positive thing or as a potential threat, the anti-immigrant language that we hear, for example, being, a, uh, being an example of the threatening version of that. Um, the polarization that we experience is much deeper today than it was in part because of technology. Today, you know, you can get your news on one cable channel, I can get my news on another one. We're not all watching the same programming, getting our news from the same place. Our local newspapers are drying up. People are getting their news on their social media feeds. You know, if I'm using Twitter and you're using Twitter, we might be getting completely different news because of the people we follow or how that information is being curated for us. So we find that there is increasingly this sense of us versus them. Now that us versus them thinking is often shaped by political leaders who talk in those ways. Um, leadership matters and it's something that does influence how we view the world. But the greater polarization in our society over the last 20 years is certainly a factor. And then the last P that I like to talk about and it's reflected in the 20th anniversary version of my book is the changes in psychology. Psychology as a field is different today. Some of the ideas that we talk about, for example, implicit bias. I bet many people in this audience have heard that phrase, maybe have a sense of what it means, you know, those biases we're not quite aware of. But most of the research about implicit bias was done in the 21st century, in the last 20 years. And so when we think about not just how we engage with each other, but what we know about each other and how we um, understand human behavior, that's changed too. And that's reflected in the book as well. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. You know, why is racial classification, why has it been so important in the United States? You know, that's a great question, but it's a hard one to answer without going back in time. Because if, and you really have to go pretty far back to find the roots of why it has mattered so much in our society. I'm gonna take you back to 1676, All right? That's pretty far back. And you might say, well, what happened in 1676? There was a rebellion known as Bacon's Rebellion, which took place in the colony. It was a colony then before we were the United States in the colony of Virginia. And it was a rebellion that involved European indentured servants in coalition with Africans, some of those Africans enslaved, some of them indentured servants, some of them free. But those white Europeans and those Africans formed a coalition and fought against the ruling class of uh, white colonists. That was upsetting to the people in charge as you might imagine, this rebellion, uh, an armed rebellion, and they responded by splitting up that coalition. And the way they did that was by passing laws that applied differently, whether you were a light-skinned European or a dark-skinned African. Um, Europeans who came to the country as indentured servants were often in that state because they owed somebody money. Right, They were indentured because they were in debt, but they could work off that debt and eventually they could be free. However, there were also African indentured servants who could also work off that debt and be free. But when the laws changed, they, um, the way the Virginia legislators acted, they gave those white indentured servants some privileges 
that the Africans didn't have. Um, and they passed a lot of rules about how the enslaved Africans could move or not move, couldn't travel at night, couldn't be, um, couldn't learn to read, couldn't do any of the things that would have made it more possible to form coalitions with their um, former allies. Those um, differences were really baked in according to physical appearance, because how can you tell the difference between a European indentured servant and an enslaved African? Well, you can tell by how they look. And if you know the dark skinned ones are enslaved, you're gonna treat them differently according to the laws than the way you're treating the white ones. And as those laws were baked into the system, they spread to other colonies, not just in Virginia, but the slave codes as they came to be known, really um, reinforced a racial hierarchy. You know, with uh, the enslaved Africans at the bottom of the hierarchy, um, and the white people, white wealthy people at the top. But even if you were white and poor, one of the things you could always say is you have more privileges, more rights, more freedom than those enslaved Africans. And that notion that some people are gonna be better treated, better um, have, have opportunities that other people aren't, and the way we're gonna be able to tell the difference is by how they look, really became part of the common culture. And even today, when people um, imagine that, you know, someone, you know, if, if there's a room full of a racially mixed group of people, and I ask you to identify the ones who are most likely to have a good education, the ones who are most likely to have high paying jobs, the ones who are most likely to um, have access to high quality education, all of those things, if I or good health care, all of that, and you didn't know anything else, all you knew was what people looked like, most of us would probably choose the lighter skinned people as the ones who had the access, the darker skinned people as the ones who didn't, and most of the time we would be right not because of anything about those individuals, but because that is the way our society has been structured for such a long time. We're still living with the legacy of Bacon's Rebellion in a way. Wow, what a, what a history lesson. Thank you for that. You know, as we, as we talk about even now in 2022, you know, why, why do you think that it's so difficult for Americans to talk about race? You know, I think it's a very painful topic for a lot of people. You know, when we look back, when we, all of us, look back on the history of um, enslavement, the history of, you know, the mistreatment of Native Americans, if we think about um, the ways in which racism has played itself out in our society, we often feel badly about it. You know, we regret that these things happened. We don't um, for some people, it may feel quite personal, like if you are a black person, it might feel quite personal because, you know, those were my ancestors, those were my family members who were being mistreated. But even for white people, there's a sense sometimes of, you know, maybe those were my relatives who were um, passing those laws. Maybe there were my relatives who were, uh, you know, joining the Klan, my relatives who were um, mistreating others along these racial lines. And there's a sense of guilt and embarrassment sometimes. Wherever you fall in that continuum, there is discomfort about talking about it, which comes from our early socialization. And I'd like to use this as just a momentary example for our attendees. I can't see them, but of course they can see us. And imagine we were all in a room together. I might ask this question. I might ask people to take a moment and think about your earliest race-related memory. And some of you would immediately think of something. I, and then I would just say, okay, you've had a minute to think, raise your hand if you have thought of something from your childhood. In my experience, most people are raising their hands in response to that question. And then I like to ask, okay, how old were you at the time of this thing you remembered? 
you will hear a wide range of ages. People might say as young as two or three sometimes, maybe as old as 25 or 30, depending on where they grew up or what their life experience has been. But most people will say something like five, six, seven, typically early elementary, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, in that age range. And then I like to ask, okay, you've remembered that thing. You've told me how old you were. What emotion is attached to the thing you've remembered? I don't need to know what it is. Just tell me the emotion. People will say things like shame, embarrassment, fear, sadness, anger, um, confusion. Sometimes they say love or friendship. It's not always a negative feeling, but for most people, it is at the, at the, the least confusion and often something much more uncomfortable than that. And then I like to ask, okay, so you were six or seven, you had this experience that left you feeling maybe confused, upset in some way. Did you talk to anyone about it at the time? A parent, a teacher, a concerned adult? If we were to ask for a show of hands, some people would raise their hand. They would say, yes, I did. I talked to my mom or I had a conversation with my older brother, or, you know, I talked to someone. But most people, the majority of people will say, no, I didn't. Now, if you have any experience, if you've got any experience with six-year-olds or seven-year-olds, kids that age, one of the things that's pretty common about them is they're kind of chatty, right? They tend to just, you know, talk about all kinds of things. So it's counterintuitive to be with a group of adults who remember something that happened at the age of six or seven that was upsetting that they still can recall years later, and yet they will tell you, no, I didn't talk to anybody about it. Some people will say, I have never talked to anybody about it. So then you have to ask, well, why not? You know, if you're chatty at six, why aren't you chatting about this? Um, and the answer often is something like, I don't know, I just wasn't, I just, I just knew I wasn't supposed to talk about it. There is a culture of silence that many of us experienced growing up, kind of like, Shh, don't tell anyone. Um, you know, imagine, here's another example I like to use. Imagine you are in a grocery store with a child, a young child, a three-year-old, a preschooler, and that child sees something that's unfamiliar to them. Maybe it's a white child in a largely white area, and they're seeing a dark-skinned person, maybe for the first time, close up. And that child says, mommy, mommy, why is that person so dark? What's mom going to do? Shh. Typically, right? Typically, it's a shh moment. And, but what could mom say? Mom could say, why is that person so dark? Because people come in different colors. Some people have light skin. Some people have dark skin. Um, the darker your skin is, the more it protects you from the sun. I mean, there are lots of different things you could say that are just matter of fact. Um, it doesn't have to be, oh, no, don't notice. Oh, no, don't mention. Um, but that is often the message that we are conveying to our children. And as adults, we continue to carry that message. Don't talk about it. It makes people uncomfortable. And so particularly in the workplace, um, we often are tiptoeing around it, but not speaking about it. Thank you so much for that. And you kind of almost answered the next question. So we might actually go on to the next one, but I do want to at least note uh, what the question was by a task force member. They said in chapter six entitled The Development of White Identity, you stated there is a lot of silence about race in white communities. And as a consequence, whites tend to think of racial identity as something other people have, not something that is salient for them, unquote. Did you want to expound on that a little bit? I know you just touched on it a little bit sure. about silence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, certainly we talked about the silence, but, you know, it's a, we live still in the United States, there's still a lot of segregation, a lot of residential segregation. In particular, residential segregation, of course, also leads to school segregation. But if you are a white person living in a largely white community, um, it is, and it is certainly possible to not have much interaction with people of color. 
In fact, a survey that was done around the time that I was working on this edition of my book um, found that 75% of white adults said that they did not have um, acquaintances of color in their social network, that basically they were operating in a whites only kind of environment. Maybe they saw people of color at work, but in their living situation in their friendship networks basically was all white. If that is your experience, you're not going to be focused on that part of your identity because it's the norm in your group, right? You're not really thinking about it. And um, I taught a course on the psychology of racism for many years. One And one of the things I used to do at the beginning of my class was ask my students to describe themselves in terms of their own racial or ethnic background and how that helped them either fit in or not fit in in the context of where they grew up. And I remember one young woman saying in the class, she, she didn't really quite know how to answer the question because she hadn't really thought about it. And finally she said, I'm just normal. And, and what she meant was, I'm just like everybody else, you know, in my neighborhood, I didn't stand out. I was quote, just normal. But if she's just normal, what does that make the person sitting next to her who looks different? Is that person just abnormal? You know, that, that notion that um, there is a norm that people are supposed to fit into and that if you don't fit, then you're an outsider. Um, as opposed to recognizing and embracing the um, wide range of diversity, um, not just in our nation, but in the world. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, so we're going to uh, get to some of the conversation about um, youth. And so we're going to start with the um, early um, in childhood. So one of the, the questions that was submitted said, in the beginning of the chapter defining racism, you state, quote, the impact of racism begins early. Even in our preschool years, we are exposed to misinformation about people different from ourselves. Many of us grew up in neighborhoods where we had limited opportunities to interact with people different from our own families, unquote. What is a good age to start having the conversation about race with children? You know, it's really interesting that parents worry that if they don't, if they talk about many parents, white parents in particular, often worry that if they talk about race or racial differences with their children, their children will somehow develop prejudices or be, or lose their innocence in some way. But the reality is babies notice difference. There's, you know, researchers who work with babies will tell you that babies are, you can tell by how often, how long they stare at a face, whether they're staring at a familiar face or an unfamiliar face. Um, and it's not that they are staring because they've got a value judgment, but they're noticing difference, right? They notice difference. And when they have language, once children start to talk, they can describe the differences they see and they can ask questions like the three-year-old I was talking about, who says, you know, mommy, why is that person so dark? Um, you know, that child is asking a question. Or, you know, I, I'm using the, a white child as an example. Let me use kids of color. I had, I'm the mother of two sons. My children are, are, you know, grown men now. But I remember being with my youngest child when he was three or four, picking him up at his daycare center. It was um, a largely white community in which we were living at the time. But when I was picking him up, he said to me, mommy, why don't they match? I didn't know what he was talking about. But what I, when I asked him, what I observed was he was talking about a little girl and her mother. And the, I don't know whether the child was adopted or whether it was a multiracial family, but the child did not look physically like the mother, the different skin color, et cetera. And so he said, why don't they match? And I said, when I realized he was talking about this mother and her child, I said, they don't have to match. You know, sometimes moms and kids match, sometimes they don't. But you know, she's the mom, that's her child, they don't have to match. Um, but, but that um, observation and comment, you know, could have been an awkward moment, but it didn't have to be, you know, it's, it's just kids are trying to figure out how things operate in the world. I have a TED talk, a TEDx talk you can find on YouTube titled, 
is my skin brown because I drank chocolate milk? And people might say, well, where'd that title come from? It was a conversation that two three-year-olds were having. My brown skin three-year-old was sitting with his white friend at a daycare center. And that white friend told him his skin was brown because he drank chocolate milk. He came home and asked me if it was true. Right now, the fact of the matter is, of course, it wasn't true. The chocolate milk doesn't turn you brown, but that child, the white child who thought so, who had that theory, was trying to understand difference. Somebody could have talked to him about it and explained, your skin is lighter than Jonathan's because yours, everybody has something called melanin. You have some, he has some, but the more you have, the browner your skin is. It's the melanin that causes your skin to turn brown in the sun, for example, when you get a tan. You can explain that to a three-year-old and it doesn't have to be a loaded conversation. Some conversations are more complicated. After the death, the murder of George Floyd, I had a lot of parents asking me, you know, my four-year-old, my five-year-old are asking me, you know, why did that police officer do that? Um, that's a harder conversation, but it's not an impossible conversation in an age-appropriate way to say what that person did was wrong. Um, sometimes people mistreat dark-skinned people, black people, um, because they have prejudices. Was that man prejudiced? I don't know, but I do know he was doing something wrong and he shouldn't have done it. And of course, today we can say, and he's been punished for it. But um, the fact of the matter is, speaking about what kids are observing helps them understand the world and, and not speaking about it doesn't prevent them from noticing. It just leads to their confusion. Wow, thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is, and that also as a reminder for folks ask uh, Dr. Tatum a question, feel free to drop that in the chat. Uh, for black children who were raised in predominantly white communities with white friends and within white schools, how does that frame their understanding about race and racism? Well, one of the things we know is that um, children learn about the world from what they see, right? So if you are a black child growing up in a predominantly white community where you see lots of white people, but not so many black people, um, one of the things that you are going to, you're going to basically learn how the white world is working, right? You know, the things, um, what, but you're trying to figure out where do you fit in that world, right? Um, of course, you see your parents and maybe you've got siblings and relatives or you know, you might be part of a subset of that community, maybe in terms of the church you attend or, you know, things like that. But what you are likely to not see very often is yourself reflected in the curriculum, in the classroom. And so my research as a psychologist actually started with that. I was very interested in the experiences of Black youth growing up in predominantly white communities and how, what circumstances helped facilitate a positive sense of racial identity for those young people. And the answer to that question is basically creating opportunities. The more we can create opportunities for children or adolescents to see themselves reflected in the environment, the more affirming that environment will be. What does that mean? It means, do we have books in the classroom that feature children of color as part of the storyline in positive ways? Do we see, you know, posters in the hallway of the school that reflect not just white children, but kids of all backgrounds? Do we um, lift up history in a way that allows children to see themselves as a positive part of history? White children, I mean, excuse me, black children who've grown up in predominantly white communities will often say the only time we ever learned anything about African Americans was when we were talking about slavery. And in that moment, when we're talking about slavery, all the white kids turn and look at you and, and they'll say, you know, I really just want to slide under my desk at that moment. It doesn't have to be that way. 
there is a lot of information, a lot of um, positive history, even in the context of talking about enslavement, where we can lift up the ways in which um, Black people, people of color work together for freedom. The history of abolitionism was a history of Black people and white people as well as sometimes Indigenous people working together, whether that's on the Underground Railroad or working toward um, you know, the change in the laws that eventually happened, all of that. So there is painful history, but there's also history of empowerment. There's also history of um, allyship. There's also history of people working together for the common good. And to the extent that we can make that history visible and allow all children to see themselves in that narrative, um, the better things will be for those kids and all of us. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question, you know, we, you and I spoke about this um, briefly prior to today's conversation. I was very much drawn to the chapter, chapter nine of your book, talking about uh, multiracial families, as I have um, beloved nieces and a nephew, all of whom are, are multiracial. So I, I really want to make sure that we get this question asked of you. You know, what are some of the factors that influence how today's children in multiracial families choose to identify themselves? Yeah, it's a great question. And I do um, have a whole chapter in my book about it. Uh, but one of the things we know is that how multiracial kids identify can be shaped by a number of things. One is how they look, right? Um, so if you are part of a multiracial family, but when you're out by yourself, you appear to be light-skinned European person, people are gonna respond to you that way, and you may start to think of yourself relative to that identity, particularly if you live in a largely white community. And, and it, um, uh, there's a lot of research today that says, it's not necessarily that someone is trying to quote, pass or pretend to be white, but if people assume you're white, you're not necessarily correcting them, right? You know, um, on the other hand, there are young people who might look exactly the same way, but who have um, a friendship network and, a, and family members who don't appear in the same way, and they want to be aligned with those family members. So even if they don't look Black, for example, they may claim that identity because that's the community that they feel most comfortable with and part of. Now, you might say, well, they could also say they're multiracial, and today, more and more young people are saying just that because there are more of them, right? Um, the multiracial population is probably among the fastest growing population in the United States. And so if you live in a place where there are a lot of other um, young people who are coming from racially mixed families too, they all might say, we're multiracial. That's how we want to identify. But if you're the only multiracial person for miles around and you tell people I'm multiracial and people say, what's that? You might not feel as comfortable as cl in claiming that identity. And then there's what do your parents say about you? You know, in some families, particularly if one of the parents is black and the other parent is white, sometimes the family will agree. We're gonna tell our kids they're black because that's how they look if they do. Um, and that, like, let's use Barack Obama as an example. We know that he's multiracial, white mother, African father. And he tells people that, but he claims his identity as a black identity because when he's walking down the street, people look at him and see a black guy, right? They don't think, oh, I wonder if he's multiracial. They just see that um, physical presence. They will not... Of course, today we would all recognize him as the former president of the United States. But assuming you weren't famous, but assuming that you had that skin complexion, that hair texture, walking down the street, people are going to perceive you as a black person and respond to you in the ways that they are accustomed to responding to black people, um, whatever that might be. And so he might say, well, I've got a white mother responding to me differently 
but that's not visible to the wider world. So how people respond to you helps shape in big ways how you think about yourself. Um, so how you look, what your family has decided they want to help you, the identity they want to help you claim, what your social network is and how inclusive or exclusive it is, all of those things play a factor. And it can change over time because the person who wants to claim an identity, let's say they're 15 years old and they want to be Black and hang out with Black friends um, and claim that part of their identity, that same person at 25 might say, you know, I'm multiracial. That's how I think about myself today. It's not necessarily fixed in time. It does evolve. Wonderful. Thank you for that. You know, we have individuals watching from all over the United States, but here in Tennessee specifically, um, 89 of the 95 counties here in our state are considered rural. For those involved in community coalitions within their <laughs> communities and areas, you know, what actions or steps would you recommend that they take to improve race relations in the, their rural communities? Well, rural communities are important, certainly, and we can think about um, one of the things that we can say about rural environments is that sometimes people are living at some distance from each other, right? You know, if it's a lot of farms, there may be a lot of distance between, you know, you and your neighbor. Um, but usually communities have some common gathering place, whether that's a town square or, you know, a community center or even the local school, because in a rural community, sometimes there's just one, right? Maybe just one high school um, or, uh, you know, one elementary or middle school serving a large geographic region. In those places where people can come together, using those spaces to talk about what they have in common, how they want to build their community, how um, there's a wonderful book I want to lift up at this moment. It's called The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. Um, the Sum, S U M, The Sum of Us, how we all add up together. And one of the things she talks about is that when you get people working together across lines of difference, you get what she calls the solidarity dividend, the benefit that comes. So if there's a problem like a drought, how are we going to address that drought collectively? If there's a problem, like a flood, how are we going to work together to address that problem? If we separate ourselves and say, well, I'm only going to work with this group and I'm not going to engage with that group because they don't look like me, it's going to be harder to solve the problem, right? Because it takes a collective effort. So when we want to try to build coalitions, one of the ways to do that, a very common and successful way, is to bring people together to share each other's stories. If you have an experience growing up in this community that's different from mine, and you tell me that story and I'm listening to it carefully, you're going to feel affirmed in that telling, but the person who's listening is going to get new insight, new empathy. When we have empathy for each other, we are much more likely to help each other solve our problems, right? So how do we, you know, Dr. King long ago in his last book, he wrote one book in 1967 published after his death and it was titled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And in the book, he talked about the fact that we can change laws but until we change hearts, right, until we change minds, we're not really going to solve the problems we have in our society. And how do we solve those problems? We have to have empathy. And how do we get empathy? By sharing stories. Um, when I listen carefully to your situation and see myself in your shoes, I'm going to be much more motivated to take action in your favor, right? In the same way, you're going to be much more willing to take action in support of me if you have learned to care about me, right? That mutual care and support that rural communities depend on, um, you know, they have to depend on them. If we are able to think about 
how we can work together. I mean, if you think about, I'm going back to Bacon's Rebellion. That was a rural community. And I'm not saying people should take up arms. That's not what I'm talking about. But those indentured servants, those European indentured servants who felt they were being treated unfairly, joined with the Africans who also were being treated unfairly in the hopes that they could work together and bring about a positive change. Ultimately, it didn't work for them. And you know we know what happened after that. But that's where we are right now today. We've got a lot of problems that need to be solved, whether it's climate change or healthcare concerns. Um, you know, if it's not COVID it's, or monkeypox, it'll be something else, right? Um, if we want to work together to bring about positive change, we have to be able to connect with people whose circumstance physically, psychologically, culturally might be different from ours, but in which we have this common problem to solve. You are speaking our language. We are all about storytelling at the Division of Health Disparities Elimination at the Tennessee Department of Health and within our task force. So thank you very much for that note. Yes. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be telling a lot of stories here in the, in the next year, so I'm sure. Um, moving on to the next question um, submitted from a task force member. Um, in chapter eight, in issues in identity development, you state, quote, Conversations about race, racism, and racial identity tend to focus on black-white relations. Um, to so does uh, I'm sorry. To do so ignores the experiences. <laughs> let me start over. To do so ignores the experiences of other targeted racial or ethnic groups. When we look at the experiences of Latinxes, Native Americans, Asian and Pacific Islanders, and more recently Middle East and North Africans in the United States. We can easily see that racial and cultural oppression has been part of their lived experiences and that it plays a role in the identity development process for individuals in these groups as well, unquote. What can we, as members of the Tennessee Health Disparities Task Force and other individuals who are watching from across the United States, what can we do to ensure we are inclusive of all racial and ethnic groups as we do this work? You know, one of the things that I like to talk about is to use um, a picture analogy, a photograph. Let's imagine you and me and all of the folks on the call were in a room together and somebody took a group photo. Each of us would get a copy of that photo. And what would be the first thing that each of us would do? It would be look for ourselves, right? You know, you get that picture, you're going to look for yourself in it. When we think about um, the rainbow of people that are part of our society, we have to ask ourselves who's in the picture and who's missing from it, right? So if we were to take a group photo and you know there were 100 people in that picture, but 20% of them were digitally removed, imagine that, um, 20 percent of the people would get that photo and they'd be looking at it and they'd be saying, where am I? I was there. I remember the flash going off, the photographer telling us to smile, but now my picture's not here. I'm, I'm not in this photograph. I'm not in this conversation. When we think about how we um, address important issues in our society, it is incumbent upon all of us to ask, Who's missing from our picture? Um, because when people are missing, they're not motivated to participate. You know, if if you told me to gather up, you know, at the end of the day, let's gather for a group photo, and I knew from previous experience that I wasn't going to be included, that you know, I know from previous experience that I'm going to be left out of the picture, I'm not showing up, right? I'm not even going to bother to show up because I have learned that I'm not going to be included. I need to feel confident that I'm going to be part of that group photo if you want me to participate in it. And when we think about whether it's healthcare programs that we're trying to put forward or um, any other kind of initiative, if you want people to participate, they have to feel seen, they have to feel heard, they have to feel understood. And particularly if there's a history of being left out. 
you know, we could say that, um, you know, we're going to have a conversation about racism in Tennessee. I'm making this up. You know, let's imagine we were going to have a community forum and we are going to try to address the di difficulties of racism in our community. But if that conversation was always about black white relations and never included Asian Pacific Islanders or Latinx people or, or, uh, or the Middle Eastern Muslim population, not that everyone from the Middle East is Muslim, but, but where that is often a target. Um, if we, or people with disabilities, you know, if we said we were going to have a conversation about isms, but the ism that is impacting any number of individuals is never talked about, those people are going to say, why should I come? It's never about me. I don't want to participate. You know, I'm always left out. Or I go, I try to get my voice heard. I feel ignored. It's disempowering. So if we want to um, truly move the needle on these issues, we have to find a way to recognize that it's not just about this group and that group. There, there's a history of isms in our society that impact lots of people. And we all need to be at the table for that conversation. There may be times when we want to focus on a particular dimension of it, you know, sometimes, it, for example, after the um, murder of George Floyd, there was a lot of conversation very specifically about anti-Black racism because so many of the high profile events or um, shootings involving police officers involved um, Black men and women. But I learned when I was working on my book that actually the population that has had the most often has most often been um, had deadly force used against it is actually the native population. The statistics around um, indigenous and native people um, are much worse than even for African Americans. If you live in a community in which there's a very small or, or hardly any indigenous people living there, you might not know that. But if you look at the data across the nation, that is factually accurate. So this is all to say that these issues impact lots of people and we should include lots of people in the conversation. Thank you for that. We did have a question that was submitted um, anonymously. Um, so this individual is um, saying um, they grew up in a bubble where most of their friends and classmates and neighbors were white, like this individual. Um, and they are saying as an adult, they're asking how can they authentically seek out and form friendships with black individuals? Um, they've thought about joining a black church, but not sure if that feels, it's gonna feel forced or awkward, um, but they do long for authentic friendships with people who are different from them. Um, any advice for this individual? I got a lot of advice. So I'm so glad this was a good, this is a great question. So thank you for asking it. Whoever asked it, I think it's a great question. And many people wonder about this. How do we form authentic relationships across lines of difference? It's not that easy because of the persistent residential segregation that I talked about. Um, so short of moving to a different neighborhood, which of course is possible, but um, for many people unlikely, there are ways to think about, for example, who do you work with? You know, do you have, many people develop work friendships, but those work friendships don't translate outside of work, maybe because the invitations aren't extended or, you know, but you might think about, is there somebody who I've gotten to know at work who I really would like to get to know better? And I might say to that person, I'd like to get to know you better. Would you be willing to have, a, um, in my book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together? In the last chapter, I talk about something called the Atlanta Friendship Initiative, which was started by a white man who wanted to have a better, wanted to expand his friendship network. And he knew a black man in his social network, casual acquaintance, and he asked that person 
to have breakfast with him. They met for a breakfast like you would, you know, at a for, with a colleague. And he said, I really want to build a network of cross-racial friendships. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to spend time with me because I want to do this. And the man he spoke with said, yes, I will. And the guys asked him again, you know, he sort of rephrased his question. He, he sort of asked him two or three times. And finally, the black guy said, you know, what about my yes didn't you get? I said, yes, yes, we can do this. Um, and they became fast friends, but not only did they become fast friends, but then they, they created this organization called the Atlanta Friendship Initiative, where they asked um, a list of white people to be paired up with a list of people of color randomly, you know, uh, would you be willing to meet with this person and get to know them? And, and it became kind of a movement. Um, and many of the people, not all the pairs clicked, but some of many people said, I, I, I never would have gotten to know this person, but now they're very close to me. Um, so that's just as an example. But I can think about, you know, think about what you're interested in. Imagine you attended um, that church and that black church. There are white people who do attend largely black churches and you went not just one Sunday, but multiple Sundays. You might be surprised that people would be friendly towards you. You might decide, gosh, I love the music. Could I join the choir? I got a pretty good voice. You know, the next thing you know, you're there on Wednesday nights for rehearsals and your social network is expanding. There are lots of organizations that um, you could join that are not specifically about race relations, but that do have a multiracial group membership. So these are things to think about, but there are some organizations that have formed in communities specifically to help people make those connections. And it might be something to look into in your area to see if there's anything like that, or maybe even start one. Wonderful idea about starting one. So thank you, Dr. Tatum, for that. And to the to the individual who asked that anonymously, anonymously, I hope that answers your question. Before we get to our final questions of the day, I just want to remind everyone again um, to make sure that you are, if you have not already read, uh, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria by Dr. Beverly Tatum. If you received my email, I, I sent several links to how you can purchase uh, the book, um, of course, through Amazon or Walmart or Barnes and Nobles, of course, are the typical ones that folks will buy from. Um, so I wanted to put that plug in for her book. Uh, secondly, um, of course, the Division of Health Disparities Elimination, we're doing some phenomenal work um, around this topic and other topics. Uh, our website is healthdisparitiestn.com. So please, please get involved with this work. We would love to have you join these conversations um, about about race, race relations and all the other priorities that we're focusing on. So I want to make sure I put those plugs, plugs in before we went to our final questions. So one of the final questions I do want to ask, um, uh, you know, the, the tides seem to be turning, perhaps, uh, as many Americans are becoming more educated and race about race relations, especially among the younger generations. In your opinion, are, are we as a country headed in the right direction as it relates to race relations? Are more Americans now more open to having these tough conversations and will ultimate conversations lead to change? Well, let's start with the will conversations lead to change. I'm gonna work backwards. So, you know, I've been writing about this for a long time and many people have said over the course of those years, you know, how does conversation really make a difference? And the evidence suggests that it can, going back to the, the power of story, right? When people come together willing to speak honestly and openly with each other, one of the things that happens is relationships develop. When relationships develop, people are more willing to take action. You know, I think about, I, I am the mother of two children, right? They're, my kids are all grown up now. But when they were little, I did things that I would not have voluntarily done, except that I knew it was in my kids' interest for me to do it, 
right? You know, I mean, I had to kind of stretch myself, you know, to call, make cold calls about, you know, calling up somebody to come over and play. Not my natural inclination, uh, but things that I did. And why did I do that? Because I cared about my kid, right? Why do we speak up at the meeting? Because we care about something that's important to us. When we get to know each other, we are more likely to care about our neighbor, our fellow community member. And even if we're not directly impacted, directly impacted, we're all indirectly impacted, but even if we're not directly impacted, um, if my friend is having trouble, I'm gonna speak up. So connecting across narratives, across stories does help. However, you asked the question, you know, is it getting better? And what I want to quote Dr. King again in that last book that he wrote, one of the things he said is that after every period of racial progress, historically, after every period of racial progress, there's been pushback against that progress. And whenever you see, I, let me put it differently. I think we have lived in the last part of the 20th century into the 21st century progress, certainly in terms of access to education and opportunity. We saw that progress for people of color, particularly African-Americans. Um, you know, the election of President Barack Obama in 2008 is something that I was quite frankly imagining. I didn't imagine that was gonna happen at the beginning. I have a son that was born in 1982. So he was old enough to vote in, um, in 2008. And he was quite confident early on that um, then Senator Barack Obama was going to win. And I said, I don't think so. And he's like, yeah, he's going to, Mom. And of course, he did. Why did he think so? He was a different generation. He was more optimistic about the possibilities than I was. But since the election of President Obama, we've seen pushback in terms of attack on voting rights, an attack on a lot of civil rights issues. And that can feel discouraging. But I often say to students, as I am here working with students, I often say to students that when you feel like things are going in the wrong direction, it's a sign that there's been progress because you don't push back against something unless there's been progress, right? So we are at a moment when there's been progress, we're feeling the pushback against progress, but it's often at that moment, you start to see things moving again in the right direction. And I'm holding out hope for that. What a wonderful way to end this conversation. You know, Dr. Tatum, this has been incredible. Um, for those that are that are on, please, uh, I'm seeing the hearts and the claps coming through. We yes. really appreciate Thank you. All and your comments, feel free to drop your comments in the chat as well. We'll make sure that Dr. Tatum does receive that. Once again, thank you very much for all attending this fourth installment of the Health Equity Book Series brought to you by the Division of Health Disparities Elimination, the Office of Primary Prevention, and the Health Equity Advisory Team at the Tennessee Department of Health. Stay tuned for the announcement of next uh, Health Equity Book featured author. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.